Michelle uh, with um, Code Pink and many other groups, and it's wonderful to be here with you tonight. And I'm seeing a lot of new faces, which is great as well. And um, Marcy, you're going to explain what happened sure. to our guest tonight. Oh yeah, so uh, you know we had plans on having uh, Representatives Barbara Lee and Mark Pocan, the two co-chairs of the House uh, Defense Spending Reduction Caucus, a new caucus. But I received an email yesterday afternoon saying we are being called to the floor to vote on an impeachment rule. And not wanting to uh, object to that, I said, of course, and no worries, we'll reschedule. And in the meantime, Medea was able to reach out to John and Elizabeth, John Nichols, Elizabeth Beavers, to join us tonight. And we're thrilled to have them. So Hania, please, if you will, review the agenda and then we'll get started. Sure, well, we just went over the welcome updates. Uh, will be, I, I believe, coming up shortly. Uh, there will be an introduction of our honorable guest, uh, John Nichols, as well as a presentation and a Q&A, followed by uh, an introduction of uh, our other honorable guest, Elizabeth Beavers, uh, presentation by Elizabeth, as well as a Q&A. And then we go to the end, which is our call to action, Capitol Hill Calling Party, which um, we're going to be here for, and we're very excited about, so. Yes, in fact, at, at the end of our, not at the end, but after our guests speak on every call, we want to engage in an action, and uh, we involve ourselves in, in calling our representatives on Capitol Hill to urge or leave messages about the issues on which we're working. Uh, let's let's take a moment to update everybody. Uh, Medea, do you want to talk about the CIA? Maybe you don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, some of you uh, who have been with us from the beginning might remember that we had a campaign uh, trying to uh, get Mike Morell to not be the director of the CIA. And just like Michelle Flournoy had been uh, touted by the media as a shoe in for Secretary of Defense and in the end uh, was not, thanks to campaigning by many of you. Um, so Mike Morell, with a lot of the negative publicity that he was getting, ended up taking his name out of the running uh, because he was so asso associated with the torture program. And um, we just uh, got the word that uh, William Barnes is, Burns is the, uh, has been nominated for CIA. Uh, I don't know that any of us would be thrilled with anybody being the head of the CIA. Probably many of us think that it's an agency uh, that should just disappear in the dustbin of history. But um, nevertheless, it's, it's still with us. And uh, given that it's the Biden administration and the CIA, I must say we were quite delighted that a veteran diplomat uh, who was involved in the back channels to get the Iran nuclear deal going and is a very well-respected diplomat for over many decades is now the head, uh, well, if confirmed, well, no, he doesn't need to be confirmed, right? Well, he's not a, a member of the cabinet. Yeah. We're, we're not clear, we're not clear. Well, yeah, um, so he, uh, it, it looks like he will be the head of the CIA. Unfortunately, um, his boss would be the national intelligence director who would be April Haynes and we've had uh, several uh, calls now uh, with some of you to be reviewing why we didn't want April Haynes. Uh, we had people like uh, John Kiriakou, CIA whistleblower, talking about her um, background and connections to both torture and uh, normalization of drones under Obama. And uh, we ha are still pushing that she not be confirmed uh, because we would not like her to be the boss of a, a veteran diplomat who might want to really make some major changes within the intelligence community. So well, what did I leave out, Marcy? I think, I think you covered it. I, I believe you mentioned that he, uh, he was a career diplomat. He helped broker the Iran deal or back channel it, the Iran nuclear deal. He also uh, was quietly, I guess, opposed to the rush to war on Iraq. Again, he's not a democratic socialist. He's not Bernie Sanders. So uh, we have to be realistic, but he's a, you know, much improved over Morrell, the torture defender. 
And we will be revisiting our campaign to try to block the nomination, at least raise salient questions about Avril Haines. So uh, we hope that in the coming week or two, you will share our posts on Twitter, on Facebook, and we have uh, some fun videos coming up too. Well, I'll just add that he predicted that the invasion of Iraq would be a mess. So he's got a better record than the CIA on just about every major event in, uh, in our, our history. <laughs> yes. And uh, we also posted in the ch chat an interview that Medea and I did with Jacobin Radio, Susie Weissman. And uh, I urge you to share that as well, talking about Avril Haines. So at this point, I'd like to introduce John Nichols. We're so thrilled to have him. I've known John for a decade. Uh, he used to speak at my mother's home on impeachment of George Bush at the time. Uh, <laughs> John Nichols, the national affairs journalist for The Nation magazine, is author of The Genius of Impeachment. How fitting. Uh, he also authored a biography of Dick Cheney. Dick Cheney, Dick, the man who is president, published in Arabic, French, and English, and edited Against the Beast, a documentary history of American opposition to empire. So John Nichols, thank you for joining us. Tell us, where are we? Where are we going? Well, I appreciate that very much, uh, Marcy. And it's such a pleasure to be with you. I, I remember very warmly uh, times at your mother's home uh, when we were talking about impeachment. And in fact, a wonderful event we had with Gore Vidal. Uh, and I, I dare say it wasn't 10 years ago. It was the better part of 15 years ago. Uh, and I'm also honored to be here with Medea, who's been a comrade uh, in struggles for a very, very long time. I have aged, she has not. Uh, and, uh, and also the other folks who are on board, uh, especially so appreciative of uh, Hania's work uh, with uh, Muslim delegates and allies, which is uh, something that was really important work uh, and has been important work uh, within the Democratic Party to try and move it to a a much wiser place on a host of issues. And so, and then Elizabeth will come up and say much wiser things to me in, in a few minutes. Very appreciative of people's time. So let me uh, be quick uh, and to the point about some of what's going on right now and uh, why it matters to people who are committed to peace and to economic and social and racial justice. Uh, I, I think that the impeachment of President Trump uh, must be seen in a much broader context than that just this man and this moment. We need to understand the power of impeachment. And I will say up front and repeat it again in a moment that impeachment is a muscle. It uh, was allowed to atrophy for decades in this country. Uh, it was not utilized at points when it should have been utilized. George W. Bush and Dick Cheney should have been impeached for illegally and immorally leading us into a war that we should not have been in. We have to get comfortable with the idea of impeaching presidents, not just for uh, domestic wrongs of the, of the sort I'll discuss in a moment, uh, but also for a, abusing their power to lead us into wars that we should not engage in and for engaging in military actions uh, that are undeclared by the Congress. And so with that up front, uh, uh, let me say that the moment we are in is, is a very perilous one. We, we should be realistic about what happened last week. Last week, in an effort to overturn the results of an election, the President of the United States encouraged his supporters to attack the capital of this country. Uh, in that attack, you had, saw the deaths of at least five people. You saw significant destruction to the capital. You saw uh, people threatened, injured, great deal of violence, much more violence, frankly, than TV effectively portrayed. Uh, finally, you saw the interruption of the governing process. Literally, a, a, a president of the United States who did not want to have the certification of his defeat for reelection interrupt the governing processes of the United States, prevent that from happening for a number of hours. Now, you can be comforted by the fact that the Congress did ultimately return and complete its work but you should not be comforted uh, by the notion that that occurred. That's, that is an, an assault on the basic premises of the American experiment. Now, we're all for protest, right? I think, at least I am. 
And, and I think most people on this call have engaged in protests. I have even seen Medea Benjamin on more than one occasion uh, seek to interrupt a, an event, a, a, a hearing of some kind or another to deliver a message. But that isn't what we're talking about. When Medea or other members of Code Pink uh, at, a, at a hearing stand up and say, hey, somebody ought to be thinking about deaths in Iraq. Somebody ought to be thinking here about uh, violence occurring around the world. Somebody ought to be thinking about the Constitution itself and how we obey it, how you obey your oaths. That is very much within the, the basic premises of uh, our right to speak, our right to assemble, our right to petition for the redress of grievances. This wasn't what happened last week. What happened last week was an attempt to halt the legitimate processes of government and to, an attempt to stop it, uh, not to assert people's rights, not to assert basic constitutional premises, not to make sure that, that what is done is appropriate, but rather to prevent appropriate action uh, with the goal of overturning an election, with the goal of overturning uh, the will of the American people. And, and whether we like an election result or not, uh, if you get to that point, you've got, you're in a very dangerous spot. And, and I think that the two things that I'll make a point about here that I think are important to understand. Number one, uh, I think Code Pink and other groups have been very good at pointing out that American exceptionalism uh, is a fantasy, that the United States is often not exceptional. The United States is like a lot of other countries. But one of the underpinnings of American exceptionalism has been a theory that things of this sort couldn't happen here. Well, the reality is it did happen. And the great test now is whether uh, in this country there will be accountability for what occurred last week. That accountability is directed tomorrow uh, in the House uh, at an impeachment initiative, right? an effort to impeach Donald Trump for uh, incitement of insurrection. That incitement of insurrection is a classic 14th Amendment violation. Uh, 14th Amendment to the Constitution, it, it's clearly spelled out as something that, that is a disqualifying action for a elected official, for a public official. And Donald Trump did it. There's no question. He's on film doing it. And so he'll be impeached tomorrow. There's no question of that. But it is important to also recognize that he did not act alone. There were members of Congress who were actively involved in incitements that were very parallel to what the president uh, said and did. And it's notable that after you had a, a moment where uh, you had deaths, violence, destruction within the capital of the United States, a 147 Republican members of the US House and US Senate returned and voted to sustain the objections that Donald Trump was demanding be made. And so this is, there's a lot to be reckoned with here. And Cori Bush, the new Congresswoman from uh, Missouri has proposed an investigation into expelling those Republican members of Congress who might reasonably be seen to have done the same thing that Donald Trump is being impeached for. In the Senate, Sherrod Brown has proposed expelling uh, Senators Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz and presumably uh, others who again engaged in an incitement that is quite parallel to that of Donald Trump. So there's a lot of accountability going on here and there's a lot of discussion about it. I think we have to be careful those of us who support protests, those of us who support um, you know, speaking truth to power, because while I strongly believe that what happened last Wednesday was something very different, that it was not protest, that it was something that was indeed a violent effort to overturn an election result, we have to understand that sometimes that in a moment like this, there's a rush to uh, create new penalties, to create new laws, to create new security initiatives, we have to be conscious of that, that what we want is accountability for those who did wrong, but not a situation where a legitimate protest or necessary protest is criminalized. So I do see us in a moment where there's, there, there has to be a, a nuanced and cautious and smart thinking about what's going on. I say that as a passionate backer of impeachment. Uh, 
And now let me take us, because I know we don't have a lot of time, and then we're going to go to some great questions, which I really look forward to. Let me tell you why this, to my mind, is really important for supporters of peace and for supporters of an anti-war, anti-militarist position. And uh, as I said at the start, impeachment is an incredibly powerful tool. It is the vehicle by which we can do two things. Number one, hold wrongdoers to account. And number two, um, ideally, to prevent bad things from happening by holding the power of impeachment out as a tool to say to an elected official, if you do not follow the, the basic standards of how, for instance, a war is declared, how a war is fought, um, we will impeach you. We will remove you from office. So it has a twofold power, both as the actual accountability tool, but also as a lever to prevent officials from, frankly, doing the wrong thing. And we, those of us who support peace uh, and support an anti-militarist position uh, should be excited by the fact that we've seen two impeachments of a president in the last year. Um, in effect, Congress seems to be learning how to use this tool. Um, it certainly isn't using it as effectively as I would like, but there's evidence that it's, it's come into play. And that's an important reality, one thing that we should keep conscious of, because I guarantee you there will be another push for another undeclared war in short order. And we ought to be very comfortable with asserting impeachment as one of the tools and the threat of impeachment is one of the tools that we use in opposing a rush to war, illegal war making, uh, et cetera, et cetera, by Democratic and Republican presidents. And the final thing I'd say is the way to get to make that connection, to make it all work, is by strengthening the anti-war, anti-militarism uh, voices and caucuses within the Congress of the United States. Because it's one thing for us to object from outside, it's something else to have people who are in the committees, on the floor, willing to move those articles of impeachment, willing to push these accountability measures in moments of uh, potential military in intervention, of illegal war making, et cetera. And so uh, I'm sorry tonight that uh, I'm here as a kind of a pinch hitter for Barbara Lee and Mark Pocan. Their efforts to form a caucus uh, focused on reduction of defense spending are incredibly important. This is a, this is a historic step where we are getting members of Congress to commit to reducing the defense budget. Naturally, logically, those members will also be a base for uh, opposing illegal, immoral, wrongheaded military interventions and, uh, and actual acts of war that, that need to be either challenged as they are occurring or stopped as after they are launched. And so this caucus is really important and getting members of the House to join this caucus, to align with it, to put their name on the line as supporters of reducing the Pentagon budget, and more broadly as supporters of accountability for the military industrial complex is really vital. And so I'm excited that I'm speaking tonight to a group of people who I think understand these issues and share some of these values. And I hope that among the many initiatives you do in press and Congress, you will consider uh, perhaps encouraging members to join the caucus that Mark Pocan and Barbara Lee have formed and uh, to strengthen it, to, to seek to have it uh, become a more powerful force in the House. I'll yeah. close off my remarks with one final note, and that is that uh, we are right now 60 years from when Dwight Eisenhower gave his farewell address as President of the United States, 60 years ago, almost to the day, uh, and that was the address in which he spelled out the danger of the military industrial complex. It remains the most important farewell address ever given by a president of the United States. And it's something that in coming days we should all reflect on and uh, hopefully maybe even reread. I think I'll probably write an article about it uh, with a reminder that the military industrial complex needs to be not just reined in, but undone. We don't we don't need a military industrial complex profiteering off war and off the moving of the Pentagon budget. We need to dial that down. And the work that Mark Pocan and Barbara Lee are doing is very vital to that.
So thank you for having me. Thank you, John Nichols. Uh, it's wonderful to have you, particularly given your, your knowledge of the impeachment process, which uh, we are now in the middle of. And I read on one of the news outlets that the Senate, uh, you know, McConnell has excused the Senate. So the House, are gonna, the House is gonna issue its impeachment papers, as far as I understand, and the Senate is not scheduled to reconvene until the 19th with Biden to be inaugurated on the 20th and that the Democrats are looking at, in, at the Senate, Schumer is looking in the Senate at perhaps you know, discussing and uh, or holding hearings on cabinet uh, nominations and passing COVID relief in the morning and then in the afternoon. Does that sound realistic to you? None of it sounds realistic. It's a, it's a messy, awful process, but that's where Donald Trump has put us. And so um, I, I rule nothing out. But, you know, look, uh, I spent a number of years trying to get Dick Cheney uh, impeached um, and, and believe he, him to be one of the most dangerous figures ever uh, in or around the government of the United States. Now I find myself today aligned with uh, Liz Cheney in favor of the impeachment of <laughs> Donald Trump. And so, uh, look, I'm quite realistic about the absurd um, moment that we are in. But frankly, if I'm aligned today or tonight with Liz Cheney uh, for a brief moment, um, then I rule nothing out on the possibility that this impeachment process uh, can continue to strengthen, that you will get some kind of bipartisan vote out of the House tomorrow. I think, I would hope that the Senate would move immediately. I know that's not what Mitch McConnell wants, but I also know that we've moved faster and had more happen in the last 72 hours on impeachment than I've seen in a lifetime of writing about it. And so uh, I, I would hope that there is quicker Senate action. And I don't think that we should be cautious about pressuring for that. I think we should want that. Uh, this isn't something that should be put on the back burner until the Democrats take over, et cetera. Uh, in fact, tonight there was even a report that Mitch McConnell suggested impeaching, seeing it through might be good for the Republicans and he might be right. And so uh, look, Donald Trump should be impeached. He should be removed from office. He should be barred uh, from doing further damage. These are the things that should happen. I'm in favor of whatever route we get there by the same token. Once the Democrats take charge of the US Senate, uh, which will not, by the way, necessarily be on January 20th, uh, we have to get the certification of the Georgia results. That might not be, you know, we'll see what day that, that's all formalized. It might be the 22nd, sometime around there. Uh, when the Democrats have full control of the Senate, I happen to think the first thing they ought to do, well, if it was left to me, the first thing they'd do would, cut, would be cut the Pentagon budget and move money over to human needs. But on the chance that that won't be their immediate first action, I do believe that they should, um, they should do the $2,000 checks. That's a, that's a tangible thing that a lot of people need, a lot of hurting people need right now, and that's something that could be done. Uh, they should do whatever they can to bail out local governments, get COVID, you know, get that funding going, get the money in the stream for vaccine. These are real human needs that need to be addressed right up front. Um, and, you know, in the mix of that, can they, can they do accountability for Donald Trump if it has been delayed? I think so. And I think there are, are basic things that they can do. Remember, even if you don't get a majority for uh, removal of Donald Trump, there are other options with the 14th Amendment, uh, simply certifying, you know, having a, a majority vote, uh, censuring him for uh, inciting to insurrection, which is disqualifying from holding office in the future. So there's a lot that can be done. Um, I would hope that uh, it's a walk and chew gum at the same moment. Thank you, John. You know, we were going to have questions right now, uh, but I am aware that Elizabeth uh, is with us for a limited amount of time. So if it's sure. all right with you, John, I'd like to go to Elizabeth now. And then when she's done uh, talking in about 10 minutes, we can do a Q&A with both of you. I totally understand that. And I'll stick around very respectful of Elizabeth's time and also delighted that she's here. Thank you so much. Uh, Lydia, want to introduce Elizabeth? Um, yes, uh, Elizabeth is amazing. Uh, she is an attorney, an analyst, a peace advocate. Uh, she has worked as an associate policy director for Indivisible Project, which I hope uh, 
Um, most of you know a Lee, a Lee, and she, her job there was leading the organization's advocacy efforts on foreign policy and human rights. Uh, she was the senior campaigner on national security for the US section of Amnesty International. She's worked with the Quaker Lobby Group Friends Committee on National Legislation. She's on the board of the National Religious Campaign Against Torture. And on top of all that, she's the strategist for public citizen and for people over the Pentagon campaign. Phew. So we're extremely delighted to have the brilliant, wonderful uh, Elizabeth Evers with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Can you all hear me? Yes. Good. Okay, great. I never know what. Oh. I think somebody's unmuted. Um, so I never am sure with Wi-Fi and with my earphones and that sort of thing. So if things get a little blurry, wave at me and I'll take them out and we'll try again. So thank you all so much for having me. I'm a fan of John's. I'm a fan of Medea's. I'm a fan of all kinds of people who are here. It's really nice to see so many close friends and partners of people over Pentagon campaign and some of the other work I've been up to. Um, if anybody is just now tuning in and expecting the amazing Barbara Lee or Mark Pocan. I'm sorry, it is, you're stuck with me, um, but I will do my very best to uh, make it quasi worth your time. I'm really glad to see so many people out. It's really impressive. Um, so as Medea said, um, I, right now I'm working on an independent basis. I'm a strategist and I get to have my hands in all kinds of cool advocacy work. Um, focus specifically on exactly what we're talking about here, dismantling the military industrial complex, ending wars, um, reinstating the human rights and civil liberties that have been displaced by that endless state of war. And one of my absolute favorite projects I've gotten to work on in a while is the People Over Pentagon campaign, which I'm doing with Public Citizen. If you all are aware of Public Citizen, it's a um, group that primarily focuses on corporate responsibility and um, consumer protection. But of course, as we know, this is an issue that very much goes to that because of the greed of contractors and, and the results that happen in our Pentagon budget because of it. Um, so I'm going to try to not take up too much time here, but I just, I, it's so nice to be among friends tonight because I'm just really like angry lately and it's nice to be among folks who, I don't know if any of you are feeling angry, also wave at me if you are, so I know I'm not alone, like I'm really not okay lately um, and I feel really happy about the fact that we can work together and, and fight back and do something. Um, so here, here are a few stats that I read recently as part of this work. Um, and I'll get to this campaign and what it is in a bit. Um, the, some of these came from another client I work with a lot, um, the Cost of War Project that's housed with Brown University, Boston University, and a few others. I don't know if you all have seen their research, but it's really amazing. It, it gets into um, some of the overlooked costs of our endless wars. And so here's something. Um, last year, more than half the Pentagon budget went to military contractors. More than half of our Pentagon budget, think how much we're told, you know, we can't cut the Pentagon budget, like we don't want to deprive our troops, like service numbers are, oh, somebody is unmuted, I think, um, but service members are food insecure and more than half of the Pentagon budget went to contractors last year. Um, Earlier this year, more than $29 billion for the Pentagon got snuck into COVID relief packages. That's wild. It would take someone making minimum wage 1,949,602 years with no time off to make that exact same amount. Now, thankfully, that practice did stop um, in this latest COVID relief bill. Um, I want to shout out the work of uh, Win Without War, the Project on Government Oversight, and many others who led the effort to push Congress to deny any more money to the Pentagon in COVID relief bills. Um, but that's infuriating. It makes me so angry. Um, we also know that pouring money into the Pentagon is contributing to the coming climate crisis. The Department of Defense is the largest institutional consumer of fossil fuels and producer of greenhouse gases in the world. We know it also means more police militarization here at home. The Department of Defense has transferred at least $1.6 billion worth extra free equipment to domestic police, meaning more weapons of war in our community.
unified government, which hasn't happened in a while. There's going to be one party, the Democratic Party, controlling the White House, the House, and the Senate. Um, unfortunately, we all know that the Democratic Party has been complicit in creating the bloated Pentagon budget that we are all fighting against today. So I think that's why uh, one of the big tasks before us is to normalize going after the Pentagon um, among our friends in the progressive movement. I think we should be saying people over Pentagon uh, in the endless wars in the same breaths that we're asking for Medicare for all or a Green New Deal and more. Um, these things are all connected. They all depend on one another as, as we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, and I think there's some reason to be hopeful about that. So the campaign I work on, um, People Over Pentagon, um, and I do wanna shout out Code Pink is a tremendous partner as part of that work. Um, what we try to do is we are trying to make it more politically normal um, and make the political consequences better for elected officials to go after the Pentagon. Um, we've had lots of organizations on um, the progressive side of things who maybe don't always take a, a, a stance on Pentagon spending, have signed on to statements, have joined with us in calling for a reduction in Pentagon spending, um, have talked about what it would mean on all these other issues if we spent our money in a different way. Um, we've worked with immigration groups, with climate justice groups, with um, civil rights groups, with environmental justice groups. Um, in addition to all of our um, favorite peace activist friends, many of whom are on this call. And so that's been really encouraging and we've seen it grow some fruit so far. Um, there were actually multiple proposals in the democratic primary process this year from candidates um, laying out their vision of what cuts to the Pentagon could look like in, in specific numbers. Um, as you all saw, um, there was a big fight uh, last year around the NDAA to cut 10% from the Pentagon budget, which um, as we know, there are many proposals out there. To, to me, I think 10% is like, that's like what the Pentagon finds in its jeans and the laundry that they forgot to take out before they wash it, right? Like 10% is um, uh, almost like a funny amount, but it's real. Like 10% is a cut, that's a, that's a real thing. Um, we saw 93 members of the House vote in favor of that. Um, and I know all of you have been working on this for a while, but for some folks who don't, they were asking like, oh, Elizabeth, are you disappointed that only 93 members voted for that? And I'm like, are you kidding? I'm thrilled. The last time we got a vote like this, um, I think it was a couple years ago, right? I know Barbara Lee did another uh, cut amendment and I think it was around like 1%. Um, and it just like... <laughs> it like went up in flames on the house floor. It didn't, I mean, it, it was just nothing. And so to get 93 members to say, yes, we are in favor of that, that's tremendous. It, it's just incredible progress. Um, like I said, there's this diversity of organizations who are coming on in support and who are making these connections between all of these different issues we care about. Um, and as we've mentioned, there's this new caucus coming out. It's the Defense Spending Reduction Caucus. Um, for me personally, I don't say defense spending. I say militarism spending or uh, war spending, because as we know, we don't quite do defense in our uh, military policy. Um, it, it's a bit more aggressive than that. But that is what our you know federal budget process calls it, is defense spending. Um, and it's, it's so exciting. We're really excited about Mr. Pocan and Miss Lee. Um, taking on this new caucus, and I, I can tell you as um, uh, somebody who gets a, the amazing opportunity to work really closely with them, they're taking this so seriously. They're strategizing with us. They're thinking through tactics. They're thinking through timing. They're thinking about what messages resonate. Um, they're taking this on with this energy that we really just haven't had on this in quite a while. So um, just quickly um, before I wrap up here, I just want to sort of run through what it how it's going to go down in the next few months and just to kind of remind us all there's really going to be multiple um, inflection points where we and members of Congress can um, have an impact and can affect the process but um, as a general matter um, Biden is going to have to put out his first budget proposal um, that'll probably happen over the next couple of months or so um, and now that's not law, it's not binding, it's not necessarily anything, it's just kind of a proposal, but it sets the tone of the debate um, and, it, and it shows what the administration's priorities are and that's especially important 
um, in this situation of unified government where, you know, some Democrats might be a little hesitant to get out in front of the administration or, or to counter that. Now, thankfully, we have plenty of friends who are, have no problem going against the administration and pushing them. But um, it would be really great if the initial request actually lowered the Pentagon budget. And so um, that's one thing that members can be doing now, like literally today, they can be uh, privately and publicly telling Biden and telling the new administration that they want to see that initial budget request actually lower the Pentagon budget. Um, after that, there will, Congress is actually the one, as we know, who sets the budget. So there will be the budget committees will go through um, uh, the budget resolution process that will have to be voted on by the full House and Senate. And do we know who the uh, new budget committee chair is now that um, things went the way they did in Georgia? It's our friend, Mr. Bernie. So that's very exciting. Um, as we know, a big champion of um, cutting the Pentagon budget. Um, then, of course, um, the appropriations committees are actually the ones who will set the levels for the different programs. Um, and then later on, there will be the NDAA process, which is um, not appropriations, but authorization, but does um, give further opportunities to weigh in on, on um, the levels of spending. Um, it's always harder to get amendments on the floor than it is to take on these things early in the process or in committee. Um, so as you all are doing your calls, and I'm super psyched you guys are doing this, um, I, I would encourage you reiterate that message. It's, it's get in there early. I think members should be saying now what they want out of the Biden administration and um, setting that norm, setting that tone now that we expect it to be reduced. Um, not flat, not just increased a little bit, not increased. And also we increased domestic spending by the same amount, which is a thing they used to like throw at us as a concession for the last few years. No, we want it reduced. Um, and so probably at this point, um, I, I do want to say really quickly, um, there are all kinds of proposals out there for how much can and should be cut. Um, I want to shout out um, the Poor People's Campaign um, and National Priorities Project has worked really closely with them on their proposal to cut $350 billion from the Pentagon budget. Um, in the People Over Pentagon campaign during the primary season, we were calling for $200 billion in cuts. Um, there's the Sustainable Defense Task Force um, that called for $100 billion. Um, there's been this 10% cut idea. Um, the Quincy Institute recently released a paper. I think it was about, um, uh, at a minimum, taking back the money that increased during the Trump years, which this is just a side note. Like, I always love for Democratic politicians who want to talk about, like, the damage of the Trump years and maybe are not as aggressive at rolling back some of that supposed damage for example, maybe by like taking back the Pentagon budget increases that happened over the Trump years. So I say all that to say that sometimes we get hit with this talking point like, um, oh, well, you know, we don't want arbitrary cuts. We don't want to cut just to cut. And we don't, you know, we don't want it to be um, unstrategic or folks. You know better than I do. Most of you have been doing this like for a lifetime. We have strategy, we have recommendations, we have citations, we have research, we have data, we have, we have all those things. And not to mention, it's not really our job to come up with those things. It's actually the job of this giant bureaucracy in the military industrial complex to show us where they can have, where they can make some cuts. If they're required to make some cuts, I bet they can come up with something. But I just wanted to throw that out there and shout out some great partners who have put good proposals together. Um, ooh, somebody's calling to tell me to stop talking. I'm gonna do that. Um, I just wanna reiterate like why I think this is so important. And again, I know I don't have to sell any of you. This is code pink. This is like, this is it. Um, but like budgets I get are sometimes boring and we are actually living through, there's impeachment going on tonight. There's you know, a violent insurrection that just happened. There's there's just so many things going on. But I do just want to reiterate that budgets decide who lives and who dies, who has food, who has health care, who gets richer, who gets poorer. Um, more stats that make me angry just to kind of put into comparison the $740 billion Pentagon budget that we have right now. Um, there are estimates that Homelessness in the United States could be eradicated completely with about $20 billion. Um, eradicating hunger could take about $26 billion. We could be powered by wind and solar energy at about $80 billion. 
we could start 160,000 new clean energy jobs to, to kickstart a Green New Deal for about $12 billion. Tuition-free public college could be provided for about $70 billion. These are things that I just want us to keep in mind when we think about the kind of world that we could could have and all these super important issues on peace, on justice, on climate, they all matter, but they do all start with where we spend our money. How we spend our money, it's a value statement, it's a moral statement, um, and that's why we've got to keep pushing. So I'm going to stop there um, and make sure we have time for Q&A. So thanks very much for having me. Thank and sorry you. I'm not Barbara Lee. Thank you, Elizabeth. You know, I was reading that the budget, Biden is supposed to submit a budget, I believe the first week in February, and then we're looking at passage in April. Uh, and I put in the chat that we have three chairs who are among a handful of the most progressive senators. Uh, we have, as you mentioned, Bernie chairing the budget committee, which deals with uh, non-discretionary spending, entitlement programs, uh, veterans benefits, but not social security. That's not supposed to be touched. Uh, and we have Patrick Leahy, uh, chair of appropriations, dealing with discretionary spending, which military spending is considered. And then we have uh, Ron Wyden, who spoke out against Mike Morrell, the torture defender for CIA. He is chairing finance. So if you follow the money, you'll follow the most progressive senators. So, so we have to get our uh, requests in early and we should be appealing to them as well and organizing in their districts to ensure that we can cut this military budget. Uh, Hanya has graciously offered to take uh, the questions and now we can open it up. Well, we have a multitude of, uh, we have a number of hands up, uh, but I wanna say for the sake of time, we'll just limit it to a couple of questions here and we'll stop so we can go into call to action. Majority of the questions came uh, while John was uh, speaking, uh, but both John and Elizabeth could uh, perhaps address them. Uh, I do see Alan Minsky's hand up. So Alan, if you could unmute yourself, please, and ask your question. Anita, thank you. I have no question, but I just want to say that Progressive Democrats of America, I went to the website, Elizabeth, and we have officially signed on to endorse uh, uh, people over Pentagon. So thank you so much. Thank you for the presentation. And John Nichols, love you as always, brother. Thank you. And thank you, honey. Can thank we say to, thank you to PBA for um, publicizing these calls yeah. and also for um, World Beyond War and Roots Action. And if there's other groups I haven't mentioned, maybe you could put them in the chat. Thank you. Sure, so I do see that Myla also has her hand up. If you could keep your question to 30 seconds or less, that would be great, Myla. Mm -hmm. And just before we before we go into Mila's question, if I can ask uh, everyone to please mute yourselves while our speakers are speaking, that'd be wonderful. Thanks. Um, this question's for John. And um, uh, assuming that uh, impeachment goes through, we have uh, been warned that there are actions um, planned, military armed uh, uh, de demonstrations at all the state capitals, and. Um, I have seen people saying that if uh, those um, actions take place at all, at all of the capitals, that there's a chance that Trump, even an impeached Trump, could uh, call for, for martial law and, uh, and prevent the inauguration from happening. And I'd just like some clarification. Do you think that that's possible? I think it's unlikely. Uh, but I, we have seen Donald Trump go to extremes at so many turns and in so many ways that I think you have to be prepared for it. Uh, Nancy Pelosi uh, over the weekend was in contact with the Joint Chiefs of Staff about, you know, who's got their finger on the nuclear button. Uh, you know, this is big deal stuff we're talking about, and we should not be casual about it. We are in a moment where a very unstable, very damaged man is the president of the United States. And he will be so for barring impeachment or the 25th Amendment, he will be so for the better part of another week. Uh, and this is a time when we ought to be very, very conscious. So with all that said, I don't anticipate that a effort by the president to declare martial law uh, will occur or that it would be successful. Uh, I think he, there, that would be your 25th Amendment moment. And if I can say one final thing that, you know, believe me, this is way outside of uh, the usual parameters of how we would talk about these things.
but I'm not sure that Mitch McConnell is um, on the on the Trump side anymore. And and so if Trump were to take actions that that went to such extremes as you're describing potential, and these are things to be concerned about. Um, I I think that one of the reasons I think that there is a possibility that McConnell would act as well. Um, and so it's a terrible, it's an odd thing to be in a circumstance where we're putting our confidence in Liz Cheney, Mike Pence, and Mitch McConnell as our, you know, but that is the moment we find ourselves in. And we should be conscious that in, again, in the history of the world, there are many countries where unlikely popular front coalitions that extend from the right, you know, all the way over to the far left uh, have become critical. Uh, I, I don't think it's too much to say that, that at least for the next week, we have to be prepared uh, for all such responses. And I guess that brings us to the next question, John, uh, from, um, oh, I lost my, uh, oh, Sharon and Mike. Um, should the, uh, well, no, actually, let me, go. it's actually from Ellen Mass, who asks, what are the social consequences if Donald Trump is in control after Senate does not impeach him? If, if the Senate does that, what are the social consequences if the Senate does not impeach, right? Well, um, look, this, this week's going to move very, very fast. And so the House will impeach, House will impeach tomorrow. Uh, then the Senate would have the opportunity to act sometime after tomorrow. It could act immediately. It doesn't, impeachment, I've tried to teach people over many years, doesn't take a lot of time. You could, you can have your trial and your vote in a day. That's, that's certainly doable. And so the, the consequences are this. If the, if Donald Trump exploits a, a moment in which it seems that the Senate is not going to act. That's a that's a dangerous void. That's a, a place where we ought to be concerned, and that is one of the reasons why I think that uh, Chuck Schumer's suggestion that he may try to pull the bill, right? You know, try to try to force action in a sooner point is certainly appropriate if indeed you were to get to something like that. Bottom line, though, is once Donald Trump is out of office, it is still important to see the accountability effort through to its end, be it through impeachment or be it through a 14th Amendment effort to make sure that he never seeks office again. Uh, this is really important stuff because I can promise you, uh, having covered Donald Trump for a long time, if he has the option, once he's out of office, if he has the option to run for president again in 2024, um, you would be in a situation where he will leverage that opportunity to essentially become a president in exile. And he will do it uh, very aggressively. Uh, you will see a continuation of a lot of stuff that, that we've seen up to this point. I'm not a fan of term limits. I'm not a fan of disqualifying people from running for office. Generally, I think that's, uh, that's not where I like to go. But the fact of the matter is the 14th Amendment written after the Civil War was written at a time of instability where there was a desire to make sure that um, those who might use positions of power to literally undo the government of the United States or to upend it for incredibly nefarious and dangerous purposes could be barred from doing so. And I do think that this is an important reality. I agree with Cori Bush. I agree with the members of the squad, uh, Ilhan Omar in particular, that, um, that you can't just let this thing go. This, this is what happened at the Capitol on January 6th was an expression of violent white supremacist activity uh, by people who are bent on preventing not just the defeat of Donald Trump, but frankly, preventing uh, this country from moving forward on, on many, many fronts. And uh, disempowering Trump at this point is an important act. Also holding to account those who are aligned with him is an important act. And we do, I do want to go to Medea um, for her question for both of our speakers, and then we'll go to Francis uh, and I'll ask if you post it in the chat. Uh, well, I was going to ask Linda Malazzo's uh, question because I think both for uh, uh, you, John, who have written so much about free speech and an advocate, and you, Elizabeth, as an attorney and an advocate, um, what do you think about the censorship issues, the social media uh, suspending Donald Trump? Where is this going to lead? Is this going to bite us in the butt? 
Yeah, that's exactly, that is a, I'll, I'll start and maybe Elizabeth will have much wiser things to say. This concerns me. Look, uh, I, uh, I happen to be in the camp that generally believes that when there, as I mentioned briefly in my remarks, when there are extensions of uh, restrictions of, you know, kind of suspension of liberties, a new security state, things of this nature, that usually circles around and assaults the left, uh, assaults people who are working for economic and social and racial justice, people who are working for peace. I, Medea, I can tell you, if they put new restrictions on Congress and, you know, who can interrupt a hearing or who can, you know, who can be in the building and things like that, that's going to affect your work and your work is noble work and necessary. It's not the same as what occurred here, but it is, these threats are real. So I'm very, very concerned about this. And I think that, that it is appropriate to hold Donald Trump to account. It is appropriate to hold those who aided and abetted him and, and these activities to account. I believe in impeachment. I believe in accountability for members of Congress. By the same token, I'm very, very concerned about um, any threats to the right to speak, the right to assemble, the right to petition for the redress of grievances. And I do think that we have to think about the power of big tech and its ability to silence voices. At this point, um, you know, addressing Trump's, frankly, calls to violence, in, in my view, uh, is understandable. And I can understand it in the, in the narrow context of the moment. But if that becomes a precedent and we are allowing multinational corporations to define, you know, basically our free speech rights, that's an incredibly dangerous place to go. So we have to, we have to be very vigilant in this moment. And our, our, our concern about Donald Trump and our desire to hold him to account, that can be done within the context of the Constitution at this point. It merely takes courage on the part of our members of Congress, our elected officials. We do not have to create a new national security state that limits uh, freedom of speech, freedom of movement, freedom of activity. And Elizabeth? I don't want to take up too much more time because John, um, I would I would echo all of his concerns and I, I would just add on top of my uh, um, concern about the, the potential for empowering Silicon Valley to choose who has access to communications um, channels. And this is speaking on my own account, not necessarily even in my clients, but that, that we all use and we depend on for communications. Um, for peace activists, we, we know where those roads go down sometimes, right? Um, and I would add that that is um, also why I, I vehemently oppose um, new domestic terrorism laws and the push to call what more things terrorism because that inevitably ends in an empowered and increased security state that is only ever really utilized against the marginalized um, and to suppress real meaningful dissent and challenges to the military industrial complex among many other things. So um, I, I would just echo all those concerns and say that, you know, precedent is, is important. It really matters. Um, a question that came up by Francis Yasmin is uh, when we get a chance to ask our reps if they will join this caucus, what is the best way to connect with them if they say yes? Uh, tell them to get in contact with Mark Pocan's office. Yeah, that's there um, or or Barbara Lee's office, um, but they are they're able to just add people directly to the caucus. Yeah, that'll be part of our capital calling action alert. Oh, great! Stay tuned. Cool. And if I could just I, say, I, in December, I can assure I you. Oh, sorry. Oh, I, I can assure you that Barbara Lee and Mark Pocan will be really thrilled to get the calls. Nice. In December, I was able to ask both Ted Liu and Sarah Jacobs um, if they were interested. Their ears lit up. They seemed super excited about it, and they were both interested in uh, following up. So just a thank you. Yep. yep. And I don't know how many uh, questions we can ask. Um, it is we're kind of nearing 6 o'clock, 6 p.m. So um, maybe a couple more. Sure. Yeah. OK. There is a question that came to me in private. Um, why call for Trump's, why not call for uh, Trump's immediate uh, arrest? And I can't see the name because it's a direct message. I can't see the name for some reason, so. Um, look, there are people calling for Trump's uh, arrest and prosecution. You've, you've heard that. Um, and the, it's, I understand the, the passion for it. 
At this point, though, uh, that is unlikely. We, that is an area of the law that is very under adjudicated. Uh, the idea of arresting a sitting president for wrongdoing, that, that has not happened. And, uh, and it is unlikely to happen. Doesn't mean people can't call for it. Certainly doesn't mean that people shouldn't call for um, prosecution of Donald Trump after he is out of office uh, and for holding him to account. Uh, it also doesn't mean that you, we shouldn't be very conscious of uh, the abuses of the pardon process. Uh, but at this point, uh, let's not let members of Congress off the hook. They have the ability to disempower Donald Trump right now. They have the ability to vote to impeach him and to remove him from office. That's step one. And associated with that step is the disqualifying him from seeking further positions. Once that's done, uh, I think there is there's certainly room for local, state, and federal prosecutions because there's plenty uh, to hold this president to account for. And Elizabeth, would you like to also add to this? No, I'll defer to John on that one. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll just go to my uh, last question is, how can we get rid of God Bless America at the end of every political leader's speech? <laughs> And this is by Marilyn. So thank you, Marilyn, for the question. Happy to start there. Um, I there's uh, to me, it's a reminder that there's so many little things like that, right? Like um, I get asked at the grocery store all the time in the checkout line, like, would you like to round up your you know dollar amount to support you know troops eating food? Um, uh, little things like that, right? Like there's so much. Um, uh, just militarism baked into everything. And, and again, like I'm all like a lot of people who serve um, are gen genuinely food insecure and are not, their human needs are not met and that's um, unacceptable. But like, hey, we have a $740 billion Pentagon budget. I bet they could find a few pennies to help out. Um, but, you know, we have a cultural shift that has to happen too, right? Um, I know you all were talking earlier on about Mike Morrell and about the um, scourge of torture policy. And, um, you know, that's an area I've worked on quite a bit as well. And, and, and I was really struck. I, I wrote a little thing on it once. I can send around maybe. Um, but how, how because of what the United States chose to do, we had this weird shift in, in our art, in our, in our culture and the way torture is depicted. Um, there are several like kids movies that paint torture in sort of like a funny joking light um, in the original Shrek movie and the Minions movies. Um, there's these torture scenes that are played for laughs. There's um, films being made that glorifies torture. Like it was no longer a thing that was just, this is off the table and it's a thing that should never be done for any circumstances. It it's come all the way as a joke. And so I say all that to say like law and policy, they aren't just like things that people in DC do. They are things that um, uh, affect the way we live our lives and, and the way we express ourselves. And um, I think that it always does, it does have to come from the people. Things have to um, uh, sort of go out of fashion um, and become no longer really um, acceptable to, to say or to do. And, and you know, I it, this is obviously like not one of the more insidious things that we're facing right now is people saying, God bless America, God bless the troops, whatever, but it's indicative of the way that like the primacy of the military, the over glorification of the tool of militarism has just influenced our society. And so, you know, my thought on those things is that you know, as we push for changed policies, we are also change, pushing for a changed culture um, and a changed awareness and, and thinking about the role that the military plays in our society. I mean, like poll after poll shows that in this weird time of the Trump era, different feelings about different institutions has kind of waxed and waned. People see the media in a different way. People see doctors in a different way, scientists, but like the military consistently gets public um, uh, respect and approval and, and belief. And um, that doesn't happen just by accident, right? Like there, there are decades of militarism policy that helped that happen. So um, by shifting to a more peaceful world, I think we have a more peaceful culture, both in, in our language, our art, our culture, everything. Thank you so much, Elizabeth Beavers with People Over Pentagon and John Nichols with The Nation Magazine. It's a great honor to have you with us tonight. And if anyone uh, wants to reach you, well, maybe you can just uh, give us a, con a way to contact you and then we'll move on to our action alert. 
So I'll put it in the chat. Thank you all so much for having me. John, if you can put it in the chat too, that'd be terrific. I'm glad to. And let me let me also just thank everyone for joining us tonight. It's wonderful to have 200 people on such an incredibly intense night and in such a, a rare moment in American history come together to keep the focus on peace and economic and social and racial justice. Uh, I really love the work of Code Pink. I cherish the allies that are on board here, PDA and others. And uh, I can only say that that uh, when Medea called and asked me to join you tonight, it wasn't as if I didn't have other things to do. Uh, and I know that's true for Elizabeth as well. But the work of Code Pink, the work of PDA, the work of these other groups that are involved is so very, very vital. And we can never take our eye off the prize of cutting the Pentagon budget and reass reasserting human needs and human values in this country. So thanks for having me. Thank you, John. Thank you, thank you so much, John and Elizabeth. Let's give them a, uh, a virtual clapping. All right, at this point, we have 188 people on the call with us and we urge you all to stay with us. We're gonna move into our Capitol, call, Capitol Hill calling party right now. And our ask is for our own representatives, our Congress member, who we will be calling and leaving a message for to join the House uh, the Defense Spending Reduction Caucus. And I believe that the action alert has been posted in the chat. Let's see. Yes, it's there. It's there? Okay. Yeah. All right. So if you scroll Mary posted up. it, we can repost it. I'll repost it. Okay. Yeah. Please do repost it. So basically what we're doing, and there's a script for you, uh, we ask that you call the Capitol Hill switchboard. Uh, I believe you can put in your zip code and they'll send you over to your congressperson's office and you can leave a message for them. Let's see how many, how many calls we can make tonight. After we make those calls, I'd appreciate it if you would also send an email. It's good to have a paper trail uh, asking your representative to do this and asking to, for a response, that you expect a response. Uh, lastly, we'll ask that you share this action with friends, uh, post it somewhere, email it to friends. Let's get your friends to do the same, okay? So let us begin. If you have a phone, great. If uh, you have a computer and you want to send an email, you can start with that. Either way. I'm going to mute my It's nine o'clock in Washington, D.C. Is the switchboard going to answer the phone? I believe it does. Yes, it does. yes, they do all night long. I mean, it, sometimes it's automated and you say who you want. Okay, let's do it. And I just asked, did, <clears throat> it looks like Frances is on the phone now, but didn't she say that she had spoken to Ted Lou already and that he had uh, expressed interest in joining the caucus? Even if he said that, you know, you could ask to have kind of confirmation that he's joined. Okay. And cover support. Do we know if anyone has joined already besides Lee and Pocon? We don't have a list yet. Hope to get one soon. Thank you. Are people getting through? Are people getting through? Yeah? No. I think we just overwhelmed them, so let's keep trying. Some are getting through. Okay, you can also email right now. The email's in the chat. You can also get a direct number for your congressperson if you just look them up their name uh, and, and their official website. 
Uh, my mailbox was full. <laughs> you can but send I... them an email. Send them an okay. email, please. Okay. One. You have reached the United States Senate. Please speak your state or enter your zip code. Arizona. You have entered Arizona. If this is correct, press or say none. Uh, So I know some of you already made the calls and some of you haven't been able to get through. However, everybody should be able to send an email. To right. your representative. And if you're on Twitter or on Facebook, you can visit their Facebook page to make it a public request. Uh, and Marcy, I wanted to uh, talk about the next weeks. Sure. Am I bothering people who are calling? Maybe we'll give it a few more minutes, let people uh, looks like most people have called. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to say next week we have Yemen. Uh, we'd like to make that a key issue that we push Biden on. And the week after that, Iran. And if you want to put in the chat, any other issue you think is really important um, for these Tuesday evening calls, please go ahead and do that.
as some of you know, I'm a, I'm a Twitter enthusiast. And so I just tweeted uh, Ted Lou, and I put a link to my tweet and the text of my tweet. You can retweet it, please, if you would. Um, I know Francis and I follow, one, and Marcy follow one another on Twitter and try to elevate uh, one another's voices. Uh, but I, I tweeted at Ted Lou and I said, uh, thanks for your leadership in these perilous times. I'm hoping you plan to join the new Defense Spending Reduction Caucus. And I also put in um, uh, Mark Pocan and Barbara Lee's um, Twitter handles along with Ted's. So that's also an option, a way to go. So we can, we can hit them on all fronts, phoning, letters, faxing, email, and I'm Twitter. Gonna, I'm gonna, when, as soon as I get off, I'm gonna read There's it. only one of us doing it. <laughs> what, Alice? I said only, only one of us is doing it. They're gonna get hit by 20 things. And it, it's good, no, it's good. You amplify your voice. So I think I'm trying to, I think I used a, a hashtag. I just kind of made one up for the moment, but maybe uh, I, which is cut military funding because oh I, I also I don't particularly like to call it defense spending. It's just a, right. a euphemism. Right, absolutely. So it's now uh, almost 6.15 and I think most of us have either called or emailed our, our representative and I do urge you to, to encourage others to follow suit as well. We need to plug these representatives' offices, yes. Uh, and we can have an action alert coming out of this yeah, to our email alert. list so we can. Sure, Alice, I was gonna say that the action alerts will be posted in our Google group. If you are a member, great. If you are not and want to join, I just email me marcy, M-A-R-C-Y at codepink.org. I put it in the chat. Uh, we'll also uh, be sending out an action alert about it to the Code Pink list. But the best way to get the information is to join the Google group. Medea, uh, Hania, any uh, other thoughts before we close? I, I have another thought. Okay. Um, I, I just got a, um, a message from uh, Joseph, who's uh, told me he's following me on Twitter and I'll follow back. But I think that one of the things that we could also do here is to put our Twitter handles in so that we all follow one another and retweet one another and elevate our collective uh, Twitter reach. Good idea, yeah, and we are forming a Twitter group. Uh, the groups can accommodate, I think, up to 50 Twitter users and we've got about, I don't know, 15 to 20 right now. So if you're active on Twitter, let me know and uh, we'll put you in the group if you wanna be in the group. All right, so um, do you have any a few last words for the evening? Well, we, we hit over 200 uh, tonight in terms of participants. So we are growing and that's fabulous. Uh, please let your friends know uh, this is something consistent every Tuesday night. We're grading great uh, ideas from you in the chat of other things you would like to hear. Uh, some people have talked about Latin America, wanting to hear what Biden might do in terms of Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua. Um, you can always send your ideas to any of us. Uh, and um, uh, Marcy, um, is it Marcy at codepink.org? Uh, and thank you so much. And Hania, why don't you close us out? Well, okay. before, you, before you close, let, let me just say, remind everyone to save the chat before we close That's the good. meeting. Yeah, if you want to save the chat, just go to the bottom of your chat box. There is a box with a few dots in it. You click on the chat, then it will say, uh, we'll give you some options. I think the first one is save chat. Just save chat. Thank so you. I, I will finish this by saying, um, I spoke to my mother a couple of nights ago, and I think this was really after um, our honorable guest speaker, Norman Solomon had spoken about Iran. And we talked about that a little bit, which is gonna be another call as uh, Medea mentioned. Um, and she said, if our allies, if, 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 if our countrymen and women knew how much our allies in America love them, they would have the drive to fight. So I wanna thank you all, whoever is joining this call every single week, who's a 
peace activist who takes the time to be here with us for an hour and a half um, to, to, to make this an action call to move us forward um, on behalf of every Iranian in Iran who's struggling right now. So I love you all. I look forward to seeing you every single week. And yeah, that's really about it. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next Tuesday. Why don't we un unmute and we can say goodbye to each other. Bye. 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 Bye, Dan. Thank you for staying on, taking action. Bye, Marcy. Bye.